Uh, good morning. I'm Jerry Firestein. I'm the Senior Vice President here at the Middle East Institute. And uh, we're pleased to welcome you here today uh, for a talk that's going to examine the history of Israeli annexationism, uh, the effects of Israeli institutions and democracy, and what all of this means uh, for the future of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Uh, before we start, it's my pleasure to welcome uh, Khaled al-Gindi. Uh, Khaled, uh, do you want to stand up for a second? Uh, Khaled has just joined the Middle East Institute as our uh, senior fellow and the director of Palestinian and Palestinian-Israeli affairs. Uh, Khaled, uh, with MEI, is going to highlight uh, the efforts of Palestinian civil society and national movements uh, in the context uh, not only of the domestic environment inside uh, Palestine, uh, but also uh, in the uh, context of the occupation uh, and uh, broader social, economic, and political trends. Uh, we're looking forward to a diverse and sustained uh, dialogue at MEI about Palestine and Palestinian-Israeli efforts. Uh, today's conversation is going to delve into the status and fragility of Israeli institutions and the impact that this fragility has on the proliferation of settlements in the occupied Palestinian territories and in prolonging the greater conflict. And uh, obviously, uh, we could not have picked a better week to have uh, this particular conversation. Uh, we look forward to hearing uh, from Yehuda Shaul and Deborah Shushan. Uh, and uh, today's event is being co-sponsored uh, by the Middle East Institute, uh, the New Israel Fund, uh, J Street, FMEP, and Americans for Peace Now. Uh, Yehuda Shaul uh, was born and raised in Jerusalem in an ultra-Orthodox family and graduated from a yeshiva high school in an Israeli settlement in the West Bank. Uh, he served in the IDF as a commander and deputy company sergeant in the 50th Battalion of the Nahal Brigade from 2001 to 2004 in the West Bank towns of Bethlehem and Hebron. Uh, Yehuda found breaking, uh, founded uh, Breaking the Silence in 2004 with a group of fellow veterans. Uh, Deborah Shushan is the Director of Government Affairs at J Street. Uh, previously, she served as Director of Policy and Government Relations at Americans for Peace Now. Uh, she is formerly a Middle East politics professor at the College of William and Mary. Uh, this, um, uh, this event is being recorded. Uh, ask everyone to uh, silence their, uh, their cell phones. And with that, uh, let me turn it over to uh, Deborah and Yehuda for a conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Here, it's probably a good idea. Though I've usually not been told that I actually need a microphone, but uh, we've got it, so we might as well use it. So, um, so welcome everybody this morning. This is actually my first time in this uh, in this gorgeous space. Uh, and we are, we are fortunate to be hosted by the Middle East Institute and to be sponsored by uh, some amazing organizations. Um, and I am very fortunate to be sharing the stage with this, with this gentleman over here, Yehuda Shaul. Uh, Yehuda has been in the States for the past month. He's been here for the month of January. And believe it or not, he's actually here on vacation. <laughs> so this is how Yehuda likes to spend his vacation. Um, because if there, if there is a more committed activist uh, whose heart is more dedicated to the cause, I'm not sure who it is. So he is here spending his vacation with us. Um, I have had the incredible opportunity to get, Yehuda, to, get to know Yehuda uh, better over this past month, which has been uh, absolutely wonderful. And I hope he will not be too disturbed if I call him my friend. Um, it's, it's really wonderful to share this stage with Yehuda today. Um, and as Ambassador Firestein said, obviously there could not be a more timely um, uh, day, week, to be here with all of you. I wish it were not so, uh, but we have some pretty serious things to, to talk about today, obviously. And we will we'll get into all of it, and I will make sure, because I know 
uh, that we are here with a very well-informed and astute group, and I want to make sure to give all of you uh, plenty of time for questions. So we'll start with a little bit of discussion and, and Q&A uh, between uh, Yehuda and myself, and then we will we'll open it up for questions. So I have to start, Yehuda, uh, much as you may hate me for this, um, in addition to all the other things I'm sure you hate me for already, um, by having you tell a little bit more about your personal story beyond uh, what we heard from the ambassador in the introduction, because I think it's, it's really important for us to, to know who you are and how you came to be where you are and to hear your story, which is incredibly compelling, and also that of breaking the silence. So could we start that way? Okay. Um, first, I would say is, 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 you know, really thank you. It's, it's, it's a privilege, it's an honor to be here, and thanks for all the organizations uh, uh, putting this together. Um, Lara and NIF, APA, J Street, and where we are, <coughs> MEI. Um, yeah, so I, I, I don't want to kind of like focus on this, but, uh, but as was said in, in, in the beginning, um, I, I grew up in a, a typical kind of like uh, North American modern Orthodox family in, in Israel that with time became ultra-Orthodox. Um, grew up in what you would call the political right in Israel. Um, did my high school in a settlement. I have two sisters and a brother um, in settlements today in the West Bank. My uncle was a settler in Gaza. So that's kind of like ideologically, politically where I come from. Graduate high school, joined the IDF, uh, served the typical three years of the draft at the time uh, for men. I was an infantry combat soldier and a commander, did two years in the West Bank, peak of the violence of the Second Intifada, so 2002, 2003, that's the, the year as I'm in the field. <coughs> um, and out of these two years, I was 14 months in, in Hebron as a soldier and a commander. And, and in a way, it's what I've, you know, throughout my service, even though I grew up in the political right with encountering what I was doing, what was going around me, um, what I witnessed, I started having questions about what, you know, things we were doing. But, but you're a soldier, yeah, and there's no real time for doubts and questions. There's orders, there's missions, and I think the most important thing there is is this bound of comradeship that you have in a combat unit that it doesn't really matter what you think politically or morally about things. <laughs> If you're next in line to wake up at 5 o'clock or place your friend at 6 o'clock, that's what you're going to do, and that's how the military works. Um, and then I became a commander. It's even worse. You have more responsibility, less time for doubts and questions. You, know. you have this inner voice um, inside that tells you that if you stop to think for a minute, it's not only you. It's 50 soldiers behind who will start to think, and that's the last thing you want to see in an army, 50 people to think together. That's a recipe for mess. <laughs> It, it was only towards the end of my service. Um, I was a deputy company sergeant the last four or five months, starting to plan my life afterwards. Who am I? What am I going to do when I grow up? Um, and, and, and I think just being there at this place where for the first time in my life as an adult, I was thinking about the world around me through a perspective of a civilian rather than through a perspective of a professional combat soldier. That, that was for me the turning point. It's kind of like the first step you take out of the box and suddenly things look very, very different. Um, it was quite a terrifying moment because once military terminology, way of thinking stopped being the way I viewed the world, I couldn't justify any more 90% of actions I took part in. Suddenly the way I explained to myself as a soldier why we're doing what we're doing stopped making sense. Um, <clears throat> and that's when I felt I can't go on with my life without doing something about it. I had no clue what to do. I was far away from being able to articulate it the way I can do today. But I just felt I can go on without doing something. So I turned to my comrades. These are the only people who could understand me. And, and that's where I discovered that we all felt the same. Somewhere in the back of our mind, we all felt that something was wrong. And that's how Breaking the Science was born. <laughs> and we started to have these conversations about some things we've done and seen. And, and the one thing we kept bumping into was the realization that people back home don't know what we're doing. So we're kind of like sent to the occupied territories to do the job, so to speak, without the average Israeli in the streets of Tel Aviv, Jerusalem, whatever, understanding what doing the job means. Um, so really, in a nutshell, we decided to bring Hebron to Tel Aviv. That was our kind of like slogan. Um, it's not that Hebron is the worst place I served in. I was in some of the big operations of the Second Intifada. It's just that in Hebron, 
We worked together for over a year, so we could actually tell a story about a house in a place. So I got out of the military in March 2004, June 1st, 2004. We opened a photo and video exhibition in Tel Aviv. 64 people from my unit, our photos on the walls, our faces on the screen with video testimonies, no clue what we're doing, no plans where we're taking it. It just felt like the right thing to do. And the thing is that once we opened the exhibition, we found ourselves in the middle of a huge mess. It was the first time a group of veterans organized themselves this way. And I would say that it was the impact of the exhibition um, on the conversation in the media, more than 7,000 people coming to visit the gallery. We were invited to present the exhibition in the Israeli Knesset. Yeah, something that is unthinkable today, yeah? We'll get to it, probably. Um, and I would say it was the impact of the exhibition and meeting other veterans from other units who served in other areas with the same photos and the same stories that brought us to continue breaking the science. And here we are, more than 1,200 men and women who serve, who speak out about our experience. There's actually, um, on the way out, uh, please feel uh, free to grab uh, some testimonial booklets on, on the table there, um, dealing a little bit about the relationship between military and, and, and settlers and how that influences the way the IDF behaves, et cetera. But this is not the center uh, of our discussion today. So just to say that it was the impact of the exhibit that brought us to where we are today, yeah? Um, what is it, 15 and a half years after? Um, so, um, so thank you for that, Yehuda. Um, I, a couple of things to follow up on that. Um, I wonder if you could give us a little bit of, of texture to understanding. As someone who, who frankly, um, you know, enforced the occupation, did the job, as you put it, um, what does that look like? What does that look like on the ground? And I want to follow up on another specific thing you said, which is to me very interesting, that um, these young men and women, 18, 19, 20 years old, are sent to the territories to do the job so that people in Israel proper don't need to know what's going on. But given that there is mandatory conscription in Israel, how can it be that most Israelis don't actually know what goes on in the occupation? Um, so uh, I, maybe I'll start with the second and then, and, and then the first. But, but, but I think your second question basically, I think, touches the, in a way, the biggest lie of Israeli politics. Yeah? And, and we all know that in politics, the truth doesn't matter, but perception in, in many cases. Yeah? Um, the perception is that everybody serves. And that's you know, part of the cornerstone of standing of military and society, et cetera. But the truth is that not everybody serves. <laughs> uh, and, and a significant proportion of, of youngsters um, actually don't serve. Um, put aside Palestinian Israelis, yeah. Put aside ultra-Orthodox, put aside religious women, health issues, mental health. Uh, just continue the list. Uh, way less people than we think, what, about one-third, 40% of the people who are supposed to be called don't, sh like, don't serve, ultimately, from an annual age group. Second thing is that majority of the army is not in combat, yeah? So right. the amount of people who actually have the experience of full service and combat position in the occupied territories is way less than we think. It is still dozens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people from 67 to today, yeah? But it's way less than we think, that's first. Add to that the fact that soldiers don't talk, you know? Like, I never came back home Friday night dinner, hey, mom, these are two Palestinians we killed last night. Isn't it cool? Like, that wasn't a conversation and, you know, Friday night table in my house. Um, for different reasons, because you weren't there and you will judge, because you won't understand, because it's a bad place and I would try to leave it behind me, for, you know, because it's okay, but let's have fun. There's many different reasons why we're not going to talk about it as combat soldiers. Um, and, and, and then I think the biggest, I think the most important thing to keep in mind is that I don't think um, silence is an Israeli disease. I think silence is a human epidemic. Um, yeah, it's a human epidemic. It's, you know, it's very easy to look through a window at someone else on a different army of a different nation far away from home. So we're sitting here in Washington, D.C. talking about a different army somewhere there. You know, these youngsters putting on uniform and helmets and guns and become monsters. Yeah, that's a very... But for an Israeli, yeah, uh, father, mother, yeah, to accept that this is what we do is to accept that your son your daughter, 
who was there now, who was there, your husband that was there, you know, reserve duty, right? Doesn't end with the draft, mm -hmm. right? Uh, a few weeks every year, you go there, and this is your reality. So, so I think it just makes sense why the walls of silence will be higher. In terms of what we do in the occupied territories, um, you know, I don't, I don't even think I can say you know, everything. I, a huge part of it, I have no clue. But if, if we kind of like limit ourselves to what the military does, yeah, because again, when you think of occupation, you probably close your eyes and think of an image of occupation. You probably have an image of a soldier with a machine gun standing in a post or in a checkpoint. But that's actually not military occupation. Yeah, that's just one branch of the DOD, of the occupation. Yeah? Military occupation means that everything you think of government is military. Yeah? But the entire you know, planning, infrastructure, like everything is military, judiciary. Yeah? Like Palestinians are under basically complete rule by the Israeli army. So we're just talking about the actions of the military. Yeah? So we're kind of like just one department of the Ministry of Defense, uh, which is the military. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll try to, to give kind of like a zoom out, a, a very quick, um, if I try to look at all the collections of testimonies we have from Breaking the Science in the past, uh, you know, uh, from 2000 to today, I would divide them to three categories of testimonies, and I think that will, you know, what we do in the occupied territories. One group of testimonies is Incidents in cases of soldiers breaking the rules in the norm, shooting against the rules of engagement, beating up detainees, looting. Yeah, these kind of stories that you pop up every once in a while. Um, and I think the only dispute between us and the official side will be that we would argue that these things, there's no dispute that these things are immorally illegal. Yeah, they're problematic, they're wrong. Um, but I think the only dispute is how common they are. And we would argue they're a bit more common than they than the official side wants you to believe. The second category of, reason, of, of, of testimonies is cases of orders and missions that are indefinitely yeah, illegal and immoral. So this is not cases of one individual soldier or an officer breaking the rules. This is orders, missions from the way up, all the way up. Um, that are basically indefinitely illegal anymore. I'll just give you one example from the Second Intifada. Uh, February 19, if I'm not mistaken, there was an attack on an IDF checkpoint near Ramallah in a village called Enavi. Six engineer soldiers were killed. The following night, three special forces units were sent to revenge, basically. Yeah. Not necessarily that the word revenge was put there, but the orders were Palestinian police checkpoint, two o'clock at night, anyone at the checkpoint is doomed to die. Fifteen Palestinian policemen were killed, basically executed. Um, yeah, so this is not something that one soldier comes up with. Yeah, that comes Deputy Chief of Staff, if not Prime Minister and Minister of Defense. And the third category of testimonies is what I would call the backbone or the DNA of a permanent occupation. These things are officially tactics of the Army. No one, you know, there's no dispute over the fact they're happening. They're not necessarily illegal. But in our eyes, is breaking the science, they're indefinite. And I'll just give you one example because I don't want to take too much time on this. Um, is what we call, for example, in the military, making our presence felt. I don't know if you've heard this phrase before. Um, some of the faces I recognize, so you've probably heard it before. The concept in the IDF is that if every Palestinian will get the feeling that the IDF is all the time everywhere, they'll be afraid to attack. So what do you do to make them feel uh, that you're all the time everywhere? You make your presence felt. In different parts of the West Bank, it will manifest itself differently. In Hebron, which is an urban setting where I was for 14 months, we had three, there are, until today, three patrols. Their mission statement is to make their presence felt. Start your night shift patrol at 10 o'clock till 6 o'clock in the morning, eight-hour shift. You walk in the streets of the old city, bump into a house. It's not a house. We have intelligence. It's a random house. The sergeant, the officer leading the patrol, choosing the house bump into the house, wake up the family, search the place. You can yourself imagine the dynamics, what happens when a military unit enters your house in the middle of the night. Finish searching, go out to the street, knock on some doors, make some noise, run to the other corner of the street, invade another random house. And that's basically how you pass your eight-hour shift, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, from September 2000, when the second intifada started till today, it didn't stop for one second. 
You know, the idea is that every Palestinian used to feel the military is right here, we're breathing down your neck. Or to put it in the term of the IDF, and with this I conclude, to create a sense or, or the feeling of being chased, of being pursued inside the Palestinian population. Yeah, again, this is a tactic. This is a stated mission on briefing walls for a very simple reason, because the only way to rule people against their will forever is to make them fear you. And once they get used, used to a level of fear, you have to increase it and increase it as a whole without a body. So Yehuda, something that <clears throat> that we've been talking about while you've uh, during your stay here is annexationism. Obviously, something very important to talk about in the context of the Trump peace plan, and we'll get to the Trump peace plan. We'll get to that in a little bit. Um, it is annexationism, right? Um, and I know this is something that you've been thinking about and analyzing, and. I wonder if you would share your thoughts with us uh, how we can understand Israeli politics and the history of annexationism, right? This is, this is not a new phenomenon. This goes back uh, to 1967 when Israel conquered uh, Palestinian territories among other, uh, among areas from uh, Egypt, Syria, and Jordan uh, in the 67 war. So, Talk to us a little bit about that, the history of annexationism, how it's evolved over these past 52, coming up on 53 years, um, and how we got to where we are today. Um, <laughs> I don't think I can do you know, all this. And, and I know you could have, easily but, give a whole no, lecture on this, no, but no, no. give us a no, thumbnail. No, but, but, but on a very, I, I would say in a nutshell, um, is that I don't believe um, we have in Israel right, center, and left. I think these are false terms to describe Israeli politics. Um, for different reasons. First and foremost, because our right and left is not your right and left, and that confuses things. It's very common to find socialists and the radical right in Israel and neoliberals and the, the radical left. Secondly, because I don't believe the occupation is a right-wing project. You know, facts show us that the occupation is an Israeli project. Yeah. Um, and, and third is because if, if you live in Israel, the way I do today, and you live in a place where the moral political crisis is so fundamental, over half a century of a military dictatorship, over millions of people stripping them from rights and dignity, I don't care whether you're a neoliberal or socialist. The only thing that matters for me is what do you think of our relations to Palestinians? So kind of like the equivalent for that will be if you lived in the 1950s in Alabama. What mattered to me is what you thought of segregation. If you lived in South Africa in the 70s and the 80s, what mattered for me is what you thought of apartheid. If you live in Israel, what matters to me is what you think of Palestinians, of our relationship to Palestinians. And that's why I would divide the Israeli political sphere to four camps. I'll try to do it quick, uh, assuming that uh, people are informed so I don't need to go into every detail. The first camp is what I would call the annexation camp. The driving principle is all the land between the river and the sea needs to be formally ours. Um, what do you do with the people? There are millions of Palestinians there, basically apartheid. Now it can be the Naftali Bennett type, the idea that we annex Area C and leave Palestinians in, you know, um, in enclaves surrounded by Area C, and then he comes and say, hey, it won't be apartheid because Palestinians will not be Israelis, they will have autonomies. Isn't that exactly what South African apartheid was about? You know, the Bantus are from the Bantustans, yeah, they just come to work in the white areas. They don't need rights. Yeah, that's kind of like copying paste South Africa to Israel Palestine. Or Rafi Peretz, our current minister of education, would say, we annex the entire territory, the entire people. Some people have rights, some people don't have rights, apartheid. And as you said rightly so, this doesn't start today. This already starts from day one of the occupation, October of 67, the movement for greater Israel that was formed in the Labor Party, yeah, was calling for greater Israel. That's the Labor Party, way more mainstream than today. Through Gush Emunim, the settler movement in 74, to Naftali Bennett today. Second camp is what I would call the control camp. The driving principle is a national security concept. Between the river and the sea, there's room for one sovereign power. It's either us or the Palestinians. That's why it better be us. That's why Palestinians can never be free. Now, if you're the most progressive in a camp, your name is Tzipi Livni, and you're in favor of a state minus. Yeah, not a real 
true sovereign Palestinian state because if the so-called Palestinian state doesn't control its airspace, doesn't control its borders, doesn't control its electrical magnetic fields, is demilitarized and continue the list, that's not a state as we call a state in international relations. And if you're the more conservative one in the camp, your name is Netanyahu, and you're in favor of a municipality minus, more or less. Yeah? But, but a true sovereign Palestinian state is unacceptable. It's seen as a national security threat to the state of Israel. And that's for us from day one. Igal alone Moshe Dayan in 67 to today. Yeah? Um, if, if I go to, for example, in 1997, that's post Oslo. Yeah? This is the classified strategic plan of settlements. Um, I know it's going to be a bit difficult, but this is the map, yeah? the official map, the plan of 97. This is after Oslo. This is while we want peace, but we don't have a partner. Yeah? We mainly want to eat the land piece by piece. Yeah, you can see the five different colors of the super zone of settlements, yeah? The different super zones that we want to take. I'm not going to get specifically into the details. The third camp is where I am, is what I would call the equality camp. The driving principle is a value-based position. Any human being between the river and the sea needs to be equal under the law they live under. Most of the people in the camp, like me, believe that two states is the program that will deliver equality. Some believe in a one secular democracy. I think that's an illusion, but that's for a different day. The fourth camp for me, I think the most well-known spokesperson of the camps will be Lieberman. I think if you listen to Avigdor Lieberman, I don't think what drives him is the control nor the land. What drives him is an old school, you know, 19th century, beginning 20th century concept of a nation state. A clean, pure ethnic state. Lieberman is here on earth to cure Israel from its cancer, 20% of its population that are Palestinians. That's why for him, it's population swap rather than land swap. Yeah? For him, a Palestinian inside the Green Line is more of a threat than a Palestinian outside the Green Line. Follow his slogans before the elections. It's always against Palestinian citizens of Israel. No loyalty, no citizenship, etc., etc. Now, this is Israeli politics. Deal with it. Now, if I look at 52 years, and this is where I get to, I think, where we are today, if you ask yourself, what is going on on the ground in the occupied territories for 52 years, the facts on the ground are shaped by this constant clash between the annexation camp and the control camp. We in the equality camp, we show up to the fight every once in a while, but it's like throwing a big rock into the river. Ultimately, the water finds a way to continue above, to the right, to the left, yeah? We might shape a bit of direction, but the river continues. But politically, there was one camp that was dominating Israeli politics for 48 years, nonstop, and that is the control camp. You can be Rabin, you can be Peres, you can be Begin, you can be Golda, just name it. Different versions of the control camp. The equality camp, I think, made it to the political sphere once in our lifetime. 92, second Rabin government, yeah? Strong merits, minority government supported by Palestinian Israeli members of Knesset from outside, and we didn't deliver, sadly enough. And what people today call the drift of Israel to the right, I would argue is a combination of two things. One is the complete eradication of the equality camp from the political sphere. There is no political opposition to the occupation almost left in Israel. Labor didn't say the word occupation once in the last four election campaign. Meretz, that was championing this issue, morphed into the Democratic Union, into labor. It's issue number five and the agenda basically means it's a non-issue. The only thing left a joint list, Palestinian Israelis, as we know, they're illegitimate in Israeli politics, see the nation state law and the rest. So the complete eradication of the equality camp from the political sphere, and for the first time in parallel, the annexation camp has made it all the way up from the hilltops of the West Bank to the cabinet table. And we are today in a place where, what, half of the cabinet is up front publicly in favor of annexation without giving equal rights, i.e. formalizing apartheid. And I think that's now on the table. So I do see the last elections and this election as very dramatic in Israel's political history. Yeah. 
This is the first time that the control camp is challenged and challenged seriously by the annexation camp. And because we're in the US, I'd like to say one more thing on this. And that is, look, the annexation camp has been there from day one. It was more mainstream in Israeli politics way before. And if you want to play the game of the Lego, yeah, that we used to play for many years of how we formalize a less radical government in Israel, and if labor comes in, maybe the moderates will change. Yeah? Remember those 61 games of the Lego? Bennett was stronger four or five years ago than today. So why is it that the Israeli political scene is completely losing it? I would say 85% is Trump. It is your administration here. Yeah? Once the leader of the free world shoots the free world in the head, yeah, once the paradigm, international rule-based paradigm, non-acquisition of territory by force, etc., the cornerstone of international law, once the leader of the US basically puts that to rest and we have Friedman as an ambassador saying, hey, BB, what are you still doing in control? Man, I'm annexing. Come and join me. Yeah? That is the power. Add to that a bit the spices of Netanyahu wants to stay out of prison and you basically get a reality where Netanyahu can, where, sorry, where the annexation camp can prevail. And that's why I think we are in a so dangerous uh, mode. You know what, if I might say one more thing on this, and that is, I see Netanyahu's pledge, promise on the Jordan Valley as a brilliant political act. Um, he is challenged by the annexation camp. And then the question comes, what is the nightmare of the annexation camp? Annexing only Male Adumim. Annexing only Gush Etzion, right? Because everybody knows, because after all the settlement blocks, yeah? You're in, you in DC, you know these talking points better than me. So if he would, if he would have come and say, I will annex Male Adumim, Smotrich Bennett will eat him for breakfast. He took a move from the annexation camp draw, which is annexation, went all the way to the east and said, the eastern border of Israel is a Jordan Valley. Now, no one can outflank him on this. What's going to happen in between? That's details already, yeah? I'm going to, but he did it on a land where the control camp cannot attack, the Jordan Valley. See the yellow strip here? The Jordan Valley, right? Gan says, yeah, is the, the priest of the control camp. He's right at the center, yeah, the spine of this camp. He cannot outflank him on this. And we are in a place where we are at the verge of formalizing apartheid between the river and the sea, which ultimately will delegitimize Israel's legitimacy. Because as long you can separate between the occupation and Israel, you can say the occupation is not legitimate, but Israel is legitimate, and that's where I am. But if tomorrow, you annex, you formalize apartheid, you basically shoot ourselves in the head. And that's what's going to happen if they prevail. So you made a strong claim. You made a lot of strong claims there. But one of the strong claims that you made uh, is that Trump is 85% responsible for the latest developments, the shift from the control camp to the annexationist camp. And so I think that puts us in uh, a good position to move a little bit further into, of course, what is the, the latest, which is that here we are uh, waiting with bated breath for the uh, unveiling of this long promised or threatened, depending on your perspective, uh, plan, proposal from the Trump administration. So I'd like you to share your thoughts with us. Uh, it could be... Some, measure, some mixture of what you expect from this proposal, and also to what extent, I mean, given the, the profound impact that you've described that the Trump administration has already had, what do you expect in terms of the impact from the unveil, unveiling of this proposal, especially given the timing, right? A little bit more than a month away from Israeli elections. Um, let's start with the content. I have no clue what's in there. Yeah, and, and we can speculate for, you know, um, 
And, and actually, we don't even know if it's going to come out. Yeah, it might. It might not. Yeah, until it's out, it's not out. Um, what's clear for me, I would say two things. Is one is uh, um, David Friedman is an ideologue. Yeah, David Friedman is an ideologue. Yeah, and if I'm him, and the place where he is, with the power to actually push things, I have a shopping list of what I want to do. And I started to check things off. Um, and we've seen the policies of the Trump administration. Yeah? Kind of like it is a list, a to-do list, that someone is uh, kind of like doing one after the other. Um, and, and I would seize the opportunity. This is an opportunity of once in a lifetime. This is not me. This is Netanyahu, Bennett, and all the rest are saying. They understand. Yeah? Not every day you have Donald Trump and David Friedman and the rest. Um, second thing is, I, I hope they will be, um, or I hope they will go all the way, all the way, because then it's going to be easy. Yeah, if they're going to come and say Israel can annex Jordan Valley tomorrow, yeah, probably we won't see support. But I fear they will be smarter than that, and basically they will try to cover up the tracks, and they will even call it a state. You know what they're giving to Palestinians? Some fragments of fragments of fragments, yeah, of of, of the West Bank. Um, they, they'll say even two states, yeah. They'll, so, but what, what's obvious for me is if I put together all the statements coming out of this administration the last few years, I would say four things that are very clear, and let's call them the Trump parameters for the sake of this conversation. One is the permanence and evacuation of settlements. Yeah, that's very clear coming out of statements from the beginning to today. Uh, settlements don't move, uh, and in that condition, there is no Palestinian state. Second, um, is permanent security control to Israel between the river to the sea. And that means permanent occupation, and if occupation is not temporary reality, we're in an apartment reality. Um, you know, it's going to be covered with, you know, good talking points of Israel's security concerns, etc. but what's, um, you know, that's permanent control, permanent occupation, morally wrong, <coughs> devastating. Um, to the morality of Israel, to Palestinians, it's, it's over if it's permanent. Um, third is trying to sell us the status quo, the reality on the ground as normalized in a solution. So you can see the, you know, the economic relationship between uh, um, Palestinians, Israelis, these kind of stuff. And fourth is not looking at Palestinians as a nation, yeah, as a group of people who have rights, political rights, self-determination, etc., just like us. Israeli Jews, but as creatures who have needs, yeah? Um, so I think that's probably what's going to shape. Um, and I do see, you're right by saying that the Trump administration has implemented many things. I do think that the comprehensive laid out hmm. vision or plan on paper is more than just the sum of all the steps that were done up to now. Um, because it's going to be, you know, a U.S. administration, kind of like comprehensive vision, and then the question is what happens? There is elections. Yeah, this is, after all, this is an attempt to try to destroy the two-state paradigm, international law, security council resolution, et cetera, et cetera. Then the question is what the world votes. Because probably we know what Palestinians will vote. We probably know what, you know, we might know what the Israelis will vote. The question is what the Arabs will do, what the Europeans will do. And then the, the, what the Democrats here will do, the question is whether this is the new baseline or not. And that's why I think a strong rejection is a necessity here from Democrats, from the EU, from the Arab states, from progressives in Israel. Yeah? We need to come up and say very clearly and very loud, yes, I believe in the right of Jewish people to self-determination, but I refuse to accept the fact that the only way I will realize this right is if, is if I strip my Palestinian neighbors from the exact same right. Mm -hmm. That is undermining also my legitimacy, and that's unacceptable. And Palestinians should have everything we aspire to ourselves, not to one millimeter more, not to one millimeter less. Yeah? And all the attempts to try to create a state minus, uh, municipality minus, so plus, or everything in between is unacceptable. Um, and sadly enough, that has been the norm um, at best up to now, if not worse. So we're getting close. I just want to prepare all of you. 
We're getting close to the point where I will open up the floor to questions. I'm sure that given the provocative analysis, provocative and excellent analysis that we've heard from Yehuda, there will be a lot of questions. So I want to make sure to, to give you time for that. So be formulating your questions that you'd like to ask. But before we move to that, I, it is imperative uh, that I ask one further question of you, Yehuda, uh, particularly because it was in the title of this talk and it's, it's really important. Um, the impact of the occupation and annexationism on, on the one hand, Palestinians, and especially that move to formalize de jure annexation, what kind of an impact? I mean, we, we have to recognize, it's very important that we recognize that, of course, the main impact of the occupation is on Palestinians. So the impact on Palestinians, but also the impact on Israeli democracy, um, which is something we've talked about, and I think you have some really important analysis on it, and also you have some very important personal experience uh, in that regard. So if you could lay that out for us. Um, so, so I think, uh, I'll try to answer it first, kind of like a level of talking point, and then go into the details. Um, I, I would say two things in the level of the talking points, kind of like. Um, one is we see, you know, Israel, um, the first thing is that Israel was very, um, very clear since 67 to today to run a one-state reality, as I argued earlier. Yeah, um, We controlled both sides of the Green Line, but we were very careful to make sure that that was done in a, formally by two different regimes. So we had a one-state but two regimes. Formal democracy in Israel, a military dictatorship in the occupied territories. And there was a Chinese wall between these two regimes. There were two major anomalies in that wall. One is the annexation of East Jerusalem. Second was the extension of Israeli law on settlers as individuals into the occupied territories. But apart from that, more or less, we had a Chinese wall. Annexation basically means moving from a one state to a regime. Or, you know what? I'll maybe elaborate a bit more on this, sorry. So I would say we have three modus operandi there. One is what I described, this one state, two regime with a Chinese wall. That was the case until a few years ago. That is gone. We are already entered into another reality. Mainly Ayala Chaked, our former minister of justice, have done that. Call it dismantling the Chinese wall brick by brick, annexation by a million cuts or whatever, yeah? But we are in a process of extension of Israeli laws and regulation, one by one, thread by thread, through that Chinese wall to the occupied territories. I would highly recommend, I don't know if you heard about the Israeli human rights organization called the Eshdin on their website, and the Foundation for Middle East Peace also has, if I'm not mistaken, some stuff on tracking legislation of annexation, yeah, and regulations, these kind of stuff. You can really see that that work has began. Okay? We are working to dismantle that wall. But as we know, there are many bricks in the Chinese wall. It's going to take time. Modus operandi number three is basically dismantling the wall. Extension of Israeli law as a blanket or sovereignty to parts or to the entire West Bank. If and once number three happens, then we're completely formally in a one state, one regime that is discriminatory by nature because they're not talking about giving equal rights. Now you ask yourself, what is the level of democracy in the occupied territories for Palestinians? Basically zero. Palestinians live under military dictatorship. But just, to, just to realize how we fool ourselves in our language, we call, Abu, we call Abu Mazen a president. <coughs> But he cannot drive from Ramallah to Nablus without a permit from a 19 and a half year old sergeant or officer in the so-called civil administration yeah, of Israel. But we call him a president, right? Yeah, well, this is how our language has been misleading us. Yeah, it's a military dictatorship. <clears throat> now, but what's the level of democracy in Israel? We have challenge, fundamental challenges, but I would say we are up there 75, 80. But once you dismantle the wall, what's the level of democracy in the occupied territories if you don't give rights to Palestinians? Remains zero. 
Now, there are different scenarios of how you do annexation, so we don't even know what they mean. We don't even know how they're going to do it. Will, will they keep military law? Will they do civil law? Yeah, let's not forget, Palestinians and Israel were under military law, 48, 66. Yeah, it's like, so we don't really know those details, but definitely dictatorship. It's going to be a civilian dictatorship, a military dictatorship. But what's the level of democracy in Israel? We'll go down to 10, to 5. Because once in one state, one regime that is discriminatory by nature, and I think by referring to what you said about our personal experience and breaking the silence, the assault on civil society by recent governments in Israel, yeah, that's part of the big picture of the assault on democracy and judiciary and academia. And, and that's how I urge us to understand these steps inside Israel. Yeah, this is about preparing Israeli institutions to the grand finale, to the move to annexation. Because if you have independent judiciary, it won't swallow it. If you have civil society, it will criticize it. If academia remains as a place where there's freedom of expression and thought, that's not good. And if the media is free, that's not good, then continue the list. Yeah, so we are basically preparing Israel to be able to swallow a formalized apartheid. That's how I would understand yeah, the moves that are happening in the last few years. Because for a very simple reason, to run a permanent occupation, it's good enough to crush Palestinian society and fragment it to pieces. And we make our presence felt yeah, to create the sense or the feeling of being chased inside the Palestinian society. And we do that and we do that and we're doing it very professional yeah, and sometimes very successful. But in order to formalize apartheid, it's not enough just to crush Palestinians. You need to transform Israel. Yeah, to accept uh, that transformation. And, and I think we are in the process today. Um, specifically on breaking the science, again, I, I can, we can do this for, um, for hours, but I, I, I don't want to take the time. I, but I, I'll just give you know, maybe two, three anecdotes. And with this end is that you know, if you remember at the beginning, I spoke about the fact that in 2004, our exhibition was invited to the Israeli parliament. By the way, not even by the left, yeah? After I don't call right and left, it's a bit weird to say it, but we were invited by Shinui, right? Tommy Lapid's party, the father of Yair Lapid. Um, and uh, what was it, about a year and a half or so, the Israeli Knesset parliament passed a law dubbed the Breaking the Silence Law, yeah? Giving the right to the uh, uh, Minister of Education to create a blacklist of individuals and organizations who will be banned from uh, uh, taking part uh, in educational activities in schools or on school premises, yeah? And I think that shows you the distance that Israeli politics has, has traveled. Um, I'll, I'll give you um, an example of, you know, one week in the office, yeah? In February 2017, for example, yeah, from the highest level. Um, this is a full front assault since late 2015 on a political legislative level, push back to our activity, incitement and misinformation in the media and government, and physical attacks, cyber attacks, um, you, sending moles undercover to try to spread paranoia and mistrust among the ranks, uh, using the legal system to try to shut us down. Yeah, we can really talk about it for hours. Um, you know, there were months where we had to have off, uh, guards outside of our office, yeah, just to put things in context there. Um, and there was a guy who was arrested after, you know, uh, getting gallons of, of, ga of gasoline on the way to torture offices because when the prime minister says you crossed the red line and the tourism minister says you're a traitor and the defense minister says you're a spy, people answer the call. Yeah, and these things, they happened, yeah? And they happened to breaking the silence, not, uh, you know, Palestinian Israelis, it's way worse. And for Palestinians in the occupied territories, way worse. But, you know, we're already in a place where... I'll just give you one, one week in the office, February 2017, just to show you kind of like the level. Uh, Netanyahu was visiting Theresa May in, in London, beginning of the week, goes out to the media. I've asked the prime minister to stop funding Breaking the Silence and other subversive organizations. Uh, let me tell you a secret. The British government doesn't fund us, but who cares about the facts, right? We're in the Trump era. Um, Tuesday, the Belgium prime minister is vis visiting Israel, and he meets the prime minister and. Netanyahu goes out to the media. I've asked the Belgian prime minister to stop funding Breaking the Science. Actually, Derry got it right. We do get uh, Belgian public funding. Wednesday morning, the director of B'Tselem, Chagai Elad, which has been also under uh, enormous attack uh, individually and the organization, 
um, and is uh, standing in a very courageous way uh, um, towards this. Um, so him and me met the Belgian Prime Minister and briefed him about the situation in the occupied territories. Um, that same day already, the Belgian ambassador in Tel Aviv was summoned and reprimanded for the fact that the Prime Minister met us. And the day after, on Thursday evening, uh, we had a lecture actually launching the, uh, uh, one of the booklets that you have on the way out, uh, um, uh, the high command about the relationship between settlers and military and how it shapes the behavior of the IDF in, in, in the West Bank. Uh, so we had this lecture in a community gallery in Jerusalem, and the mayor gave an order that within 90 days, the collective of artists running the gallery need to leave the premises because they hosted breaking the science. So that's just one week in the office. Yeah? Um, and I can go on and on and on, but, but that's the thing, you know, this is, not, this is not the beginning of the occupation bleeding into Israel, yeah? Mm. This fantasy we had that we will be able to continue to have a one state, two regime, destroy the Green Line and the dictatorship nature of occupation will not cross into Israel is, is over. That is a bubble that is bursting or that has bursted a long time ago and, and we're just seeing the consequences now. Another really important aspect that you, that you mentioned but didn't go into in detail um, is uh, what's happened with the Israeli judiciary and, and particularly what Ayala Chaked as, as Justice Minister uh, did in the 2015 government. Do you want to just talk a little bit more in detail about that? It's very detailed, but I would say, I would just give, uh, allow me just to give one example on this, and, and that is that um, um, in late 2015, Ayel Chaked basically started a new position in the Ministry of Justice in Israel, which is an advisor to the Minister on Settlements. And the person she appointed there is called Amir Fischel. Um, we'll get to him in a minute. But the idea of this position is basically to supervise the Supreme Court division within the State Attorney's Office to make sure that the positions they bring to court when it comes to settlements, land, planning, different things in the West Bank, and even more actually, all constitutional issues, etc., fits more the politics and the will of the minister and policy of the government rather than what they deem to be, you know, the right interpretation of the law or the service of public, the greater good or whatever it is. You know? Who is Amir Fischel? In 2006, Bezalel Smotrich, yeah, one of the most important uh, um, figures in the annexation camp in that sense, and maybe I'll, I'll finish with something about him uh, soon, um, hinting a little bit where I think we are going, um, or might, we might be going, let me correct myself. Uh, but Rigavim, they fo he formed a, 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 an, a, an NGO called Rigavim, which is basically a separate organization fighting Palestinian development in Area C and within the Green Line. Um, I don't know if you've heard about the Palestinian village of Susia in the South Hebron Hills, a Palestinian community of, of farmers and shepherds in the South of West Bank Area C that is under threat of complete destruction, just like you know, dozens of villages in Area C that Israel you know, purposely as part of a policy um, not approving Palestinian development in Area C to try to marginalize Palestinian footprint and, and basically push Palestinians into the enclaves of Area A and B. Um, another very famous village will be Khan el Ahmar, which, by the way, the demolition of Khan el Ahmar is already planned here in the strategic plan of 97. Yeah? You won't believe. Yeah, it goes down to detail, but here it's called in a very kind of like Orwellian way. Not the demolition of Khan el Ahmar because that's not nice, but I'm just looking at basically it's broken down to clusters of settlements, yeah? A group of settlements and all the plans of what needs to be done in order to strengthen them. So the entire West Bank is laid down here. I'm just looking for what is called Gush Edumim. Here it is. Num number C here, enforcing construction and planning laws along the road between Jerusalem and Jericho. That's how destroying the village of Khan el Ahmar is called, yeah? Because we don't recognize the Palestinian villages in the area, so we're just enforcing the law. Um, and so we have him, in February 2012, they filed a petition to the Supreme Court in Israel demanding to know why the State of Israel doesn't demolish 
what they call the Palestinian illegal outpost of Susia. And who's the lawyer signing the petition on behalf of Regavim? Amir Fischel. So he is a longtime lawyer of Regavim. Today he's the guy responsible for the positions of the government in front of the Supreme Court um, you know, in answering petitions by settlers or by Palestinians or human rights organizations. And the Israeli Supreme Court is not, is not known yeah, uh, for being very courageous to go against the government position, so, especially when it comes behind the green line. So, um, you know, that's just an example of how the entire game is rigged, yeah? Um, Palestinians have no way to actually find justice in the Israeli system. Um, the last thing I would say is about Smotrich, because I think if... It, 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 some of you might think that I'm a bit exaggerating. Some of you might think that this sounds extreme. But I just want to throw on you some, one last thought on this. Beginning of the occupation, 1967, what is the numbers of Jews versus Palestinians between the river and the sea? 65% Jews. Demographics. 35% Palestinians. What are the numbers today between the river and the sea? About 50-50. So when it comes to demographics, to hard numbers, to actual people, it doesn't work. And that's why I would argue that for the annexation camp, Ultimately, ultimately, getting rid of Palestinians, solving the numbers problem, ethnic cleansing is a necessity, rationally speaking. When Bezalel Smotrich, our Minister of Transportation today, tweets, Palestinians need to recognize they are visitors in the land, in our land. <clears throat> he means that. And our strategic job is to job. One of them is to make sure that these guys don't get yeah, to implement their fantasy. Yeah? Because the numbers don't match. And if you go to a one state, one regime, they will have to take care of the numbers. And we have to make sure that that doesn't happen. We have to, so we're in a race against them. End of occupation, two states, or their vision. That's the race. And on that note, I'm sure that there are a lot of questions. So please, raise your hand if you have a question that you'd like to ask Yehuda. And if I may ask Howard Sumka to kick us off. You know, what I'm trying to say is that the Kahana type ideas, yeah, are alive and kicking. So thank you for spending your holiday with us, Yehuda. I think you need to get a life, but it's great to see you, great to hear you. So after the, this business with the Trump plan getting revealed was announced, uh, Dan Shapiro had a, a tweet storm and an article in Haaretz explaining why this was a bad thing for for Trump and Netanyahu to do because eventually there'll be a democratic president. It's ruining the relationship between the Israeli government and the US government and the democratic president, whether it's 20, um, comes in, whether he comes in in 2020 or 2024, we'll reverse things. And, and it occurred to me that maybe there's another way to look at this, which is that both Trump and Netanyahu see this ploy as a way to significantly strengthen their political position, that this is what Trump sees as his way to ensure a Netanyahu victory in the coming election, or at least his staying as prime minister in a coalition government. And for Trump, he sees it as a way to bolster his position here, not so much with American Jews, but with the Christian right, which is really the support that he's looking for. Um, and then if he gets reelected and Netanyahu stays in office, we have four more years of this. And I think by 2024, it will be almost impossible to reverse the kind of damage that they're envisioning doing under the Trump plan or whatever variations. And I just wonder what your take is on how this would play out over that four-year period in Israel and between Israel and in the U.S. Shall we do one, one or, or let's, 
Let's start with, I think there's a lot there, so why don't, why don't we start with Howard's question? Okay. Um, I just want to correct, it's not a, a vacation in the sense of vacation. <laughs> Um, <laughs> because no, no, you don't know how to take vacation. No, 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 I, I know very well. <laughs> um, I've learned that. Yeah, I didn't know in the past, but I've, I've learned that today. Um, no, I, I think, <coughs> to be honest, I'm not that of a big of a, of, 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 uh, my knowledge of, of American politics, Israel-U.S. relations is not that uh, deep. So, you know, Ben Shapiro, after all, you know, has uh, more years in, uh, in the halls of Washington than, than I will ever have probably in my life. So I don't want to kind of like go into what it means to Israel, uh, U.S. relations, etc. cetera. Um, but what is clear for me, and, and, and that's kind of like maybe my take on, I think, on the entire formulation is, is that we need to stop talking about interests in a very deep level. And we need to stop talking about the little politics of whether Netanyahu will get reelected or not, of whether. And we need to start to start talking about values. Because might it be that what drives a publication or e-publication of a plan today is little politics? Probably yes. But ultimately, there is an ideology, right? Trump moved the embassy and recognized Golan, and Pompeo did the statement on the, you know, the, the e illegality of settlements, irrelevant to whether Netanyahu gets elected, right? This is an ideological administration that has a vision of where Israel, Palestine needs to be. And then the question is, are we with it or not? Netanyahu has a vision of where he's. Now, <clears throat> if I may say something on this, why I think that transition is very important. First of all, because that's one of the ways Netanyahu is winning. Because what he's been saying to the electorate in Israel, oh, all these people from the so-called center left, they told you about this diplomatic tsunami that will happen. And look, here I am, I'm doing this, and no diplomatic, no tsunami, nothing. Because if we don't have values, if we don't have a spine, if we don't know what we believe and that's what we promote, and we stand no matter what, how strong the wind is, mm. yeah, so when we are shelled and yelled and, and, and whatever from the government, then we kind of like, oh, which way the wind goes, and we find. And then, yeah, no, we have a clear idea. I have a clear idea. I just want to live in a state of Israel, which is a democratic country, where everyone under its control is equal in front of the law. I want to be a soldier in a military that is a military of defense and not a military of oppression and occupation. Is that too much to ask? Why the hell, in 2020, this sounds radical to people? Mm. That's all what I want, right? This is what I want. That's my belief. Now the question is, is this administration promoting that or the opposite? Now, um, the, the other reason, I think, <clears throat> yeah, so, so what I'm trying to say is that if we only stick to small politics and into interests, we can be defeated very easily with the argument. Because in the rise of illiberal democracy, with Trump, with Orban, with, you know, going into bed with you know, anti-Semites uh, like Orban, etc., helps the Israeli administration to actually deliver. Yeah? Painting every criticism of Israeli policy as anti-Semitism, etc., helps silence anything. Yeah? You, you can really see the big picture. Yeah? This is, you know, if, if I was talking about the complete eradication of the equality camp from the political scene in Israel, this is an idea of exporting that war outside of Israel, of normalizing occupation and settlements outside of Israel. And for that, we're coming to take your democracy, not only my democracy. We're going to take your freedom of speech. We're going to take your courts. We're going to take your institutions in order to cement that. 
And when people ask me why the left in Israel is so weak, there are many reasons. But the first and most important one today to talk about, I think, is the fact is the relationship that the so-called right has with your right. The appointment of Friedman as an ambassador. What's the equivalent of that? Obama appointing the chair of BDS in the US as the ambassador. Isn't that the equation? The guy is chair of Friends of Beitel. Yeah? It is because, it is because for the settlers, their, their political allies across the Atlantic here are ideological. And they don't, small politics doesn't matter for them. They got power and they're going to implement. They have a checklist. And our allies here have been talking, but not doing, not implementing. We haven't seen an ideological American administration from our side pursuing an end of occupation. Yeah? Palestinian self-determination, etc. Yeah, and that's a huge part of our weakness. Um, what will happen in the next four years, I don't know. But if Trump is reelected in that sense, if I go back to the three modus operandi that I described of occupation versus annexation, I think there are significant chances we will go into number three. And it's not going to be only acceleration of number two where we are. Whether it will happen or not, I don't know. Yeah? But, but that's, that's the rational trajectory. All right. Let me see hands. More questions. OK, I'm starting to see a bunch of hands pop up. That's good. I only see men. I don't like that. <laughs> I really don't like that. I'm only seeing men raise their hands. New? All right, I deal with what I deal with. OK, that's better. Thank you. All right, let me see all the hands up. I'm going to pick three hands. All right, uh, I would like this young lady here up in the front row. Who else do I see? Uh, how about that gentleman in the pink shirt in the back? And Phil Wilcox, of course, right here. Uh, so we'll go in that order. You'll ask your questions, and then we'll give Yehuda a chance to respond. Hi. Uh, thank you for coming. Um, you talked about it briefly, but uh, can you expand a little bit on like the struggle of like what it takes for someone to break the silence and like why, although breaking the silence you've said is like what a thousand soldiers, like why isn't it more kind of thing? Okay. Uh Hi, my name is Dan Silverstein. What would you like us to do? I love short questions. That was delicious. <laughs> Yehuda, thank you for coming again, as you have done so often. You have said, uh, I hope I'm not mischaracterizing it, that self-determination for, for Israelis, for Jews, which is the heart of Zionism uh, is shared or, or accorded to or accepted for Palestinians as well, uh, the whole concept of freedom, self-determination for Israelis is doomed. Uh, people are beginning to say that one uh, aspect of this which needs more attention is that large population in Israel who are Israeli citizens accustomed to democracy, uh, a, in, in some ways a very developed and impressive community, as allies for the cause of democracy, self-determination for everyone living uh, in that land that is uh, hardly being shared but is populated by two very different societies. Uh, is there a key to uh, a new era of uh, collaboration between Israeli Jews and Israeli Palestinians uh, that will unlock uh, the, uh, uh, the, the door which now leads to, uh, to doom for both peoples? 
Great. Great questions. Uh, Yehuda, do you want me to just quickly recap? Would that be helpful? You got yeah, it. If you, if All right. I, uh, you got it. Yalla. So uh, I'll start with the, 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 the short question, which is, for me, the shortest answer also. What, uh, what do I want you to do is, is, is I want you to uh, not be shy and apologetic in taking a, a, a principle, value-based position against occupation. Um, and again, how does it actually form or whatever? I'm not, as I said, I'm not an expert of U.S.-Israel relations. Um, there is very uh, bright uh, people here. There's serious and, and important organizations here that have ideas about that in uh, Chase Street. Maybe that's a question that you should take rather than I should take. Um, in, uh, as for the last question <laughs> about the chances of, of, of Jewish-Palestinian uh, cooperation within Israel, within the Green Line, within 48, um, I just think that's a necessity. Um, there is no equality camp in Israel without you know, everyone who believes in equality, and that's you know the majority is Palestinians for a very simple reason because you know this idea that a majority of Israeli Jews will march in the streets against occupation for ideological reasons is is nonsense. People with privileges don't wake up in the morning and give up their privileges. It doesn't. It's not the way things work or the world works. Um, so what we can, I think, at best, is, is put together a minority as significant as possible. And I think that's our task. Um, um, and the next step is to unite with Palestinian citizens of Israel. Yeah? Um, it's a necessity. Otherwise, we're irrelevant. Um, and that's how, what, 7, 8, 9, 10% can become 25, 26%, so 27. Um, there is no equality camp. There is no anti-occupation camp without Palestinian Israelis. Just like, you know, trying to do that in Israel is like trying to form a civil rights movement without African Americans. It's just, what are you talking about, yeah? Um, now, <clears throat> is that sufficient enough? No. Hell no, because even if we get 27%, or 25%, 30%, yeah, that's not enough to actually change um, uh, the direction of the country. And as I try to argue, yeah, we saw with the control camp, yeah, like that's a consensus in Israel. The idea that self-determination between the river and the sea is only for Israeli Jews is probably one of the most mainstream concepts in Israeli politics. Mm. Yeah? Settlements is still different than the occupation. Settlements are still something fishy. That's why Malad Umim is not a settlement, right? Mm. Because that's consensus. But, but occupation, the fact that we have a right for, you know, either for our ideological reason of annexation or either for our security needs or whatever, yeah, to dominate Palestinians, that's consensus. Um, so we will need other actors, Palestinians, international yeah, community to step in, uh, a positive American engagement, yeah, if, if, if we talk in, in, in the uh, measures and in, in, in the language and in the world, yeah, the work of J Street here and other groups here. Um, so without that, we're not going to. But definitely, joining hands with Palestinians is a necessity. Um, <clears throat> why not more soldiers break the silence? Um, <clears throat> I, think, I think there are several answers for that. Um, but first, I would say we in Breaking the Science, we've the hard, kind of like the main part of our work, yeah, is documenting soldiers' testimonies. That's breaking the silence, yeah, soldiers who speak out. And we've interviewed until today more than 1,200. Now, if tomorrow you would come to us and give us, you know, a blank check or even not a blank check, $3 million, yeah, we will be able, yeah, we would probably not be in 1,200. We would be at 3,000, 5,000, 7,000, yeah. Um, <clears throat> that I believe. Uh, so part of it is uh, resources. But what would, be a, what would we have a majority of dozens of thousands of soldiers who served in the occupied territories? Hell no, yeah? For different reasons. First of all, because 
when we call ourselves breaking the silence, there are, there are different levels of silences that one needs, needs to break. Um, and the first and most important one is way before speaking out. It's standing in front of the mirror and understanding what we've done as individuals. Because if you would come to me, you know, 16, 17, 18 years ago, and, you know, and come to me and say, what are you, nuts? You're trying to kind of like, you know, you're intimidating on a massive scale an entire civilian population nonstop, irrelevant to whether they're um, a threat or not. My answer would be, what do you mean? We need to make our presence felt. Because otherwise, they will attack. And we can't take the chance. And then, yeah, like, as a soldier, everything is very coherent. Yeah, makes sense. One leads to two to three. Yeah, because of course your objective is dominance, control, occupation. If you want to do occupation, that's the only way. This is, by the way, why breaking the silence uh, on a very fundamental level doesn't believe that the problem is the military. Because the military doesn't choose its missions. It is the government that sends the military to occupy Palestinians. Any army in the world that will get the orders that the IDF gets, which is to dominate millions of people with rights and dignity forever, while facilitating a settlement project of hundreds of thousands of people with rights, making sure that Palestinians will not have rights, and the same roads and the same hilltops and the same cities, yeah, will behave like the IDF, if not worse. That's the problem. There is no moral way of carrying out an immoral mission. And the occupation is a fundamentally immoral mission. But the, I didn't wake up at the age of 18 and decided to go and have fun in the West Bank. I was sent there. And the soldiers today in the occupied territories, I'm sending them there, among other citizens of Israel. So putting the blame on 19-year-old, 20-year-old, 21-year-old soldiers Sergeant, that's the easy way out. You know, oh, we're going to send you. You're going to remain clean and moral. And, and if you do some mistake there and there, we might even prosecute you. And, you know, no, no, no. That's not taking responsibility. Taking responsibility is admitting that an occupation is like a math equation. One plus one ends two. Sending military to control civilians starts with the kind of stories I told today. Ends, believe me, you don't want to know where. But for most of the people who go through there, still think of soldiers. Yeah? Um, and then, of course, <clears throat> you know, there's different reasons why people kind of like testify to breaking the science. Um, some of them will not necessarily agree with my political analysis, et cetera, but the driving force is that there is a problem, or it's important that people will know that there are problems. Yeah? Um, so most people didn't break way before they don't speak out. They didn't break the silence in terms of seeing things in a different perspective. OK, so we have about 10 minutes left. And I'm going to be really ambitious here. I'm going to take three more questions. And I want to ask the last question. So I'm going to ask you guys, please keep your questions very brief. And Yehuda, if you could also keep your answers brief as well. All right, let me see the hands. It's All right. not an illegal order, so I'll try to So I'd like to have the gentleman in the first row here, the young lady in the second row there, and the gentleman in the tie right there. Uh, and again, quick <coughs> questions, OK? Please. Thank you for your great panel. Uh, I wonder uh, how much common uh, is your opinion in Israel? And how can the other countries, including the United States and other countries, and or uh, international institutions can support your voice. Thank are you. you are you with an embassy here in DC? Uh, no, I'm originally from Japan. But, uh, uh, great. No working for it. Okay, great. Wonderful. Wonderful. Yes. Uh, um, first of all, thank you so much for uh, yeah, for being here. It's been very enlightening. Um, my question is if the occupation and settlements were to end uh, sort of from your view, what would the process then look like to ensure that the Palestinian territories are going to become democratic and prosperous and a potential partner to Israel, also taking into account what happened in Gaza? Great. Okay. The last question here. 
Well, I guess I have a similar question, uh, in a similar vein, a question of looking at the territories of the former Palestine mandate. I mean, first Jordan uh, divided off in 1922, now under a Hashemite monarchy, which has a really virulently hostile population against Israel, as well as, uh, again, with Gaza, the pullout from 2005 by Israel there, which has now turned into a Hamas rocket launching pad against Israel. Uh, what evidence do you have that any further uh, Israeli loosening of controls over these Palestinian populations will lead to peace? All right, I'm going to save my question for the very end. So, fairly brief answers, Yehuda. Oh, okay. So, in terms of how common my positions are in Israel, um, as I said earlier, we are a minority, yeah, um, and and I think it's okay, um, and I don't think it should matter. From your perspective, from an international perspective, um, because how common was among whites. Um, uh, the anti-slavery position in, in the South. Did that matter for our moral position against slavery? And how, come, and how common was a position against segregation? And how common continue the list? When something is fundamentally moral, it doesn't matter whether it's popular or not. What matters, and again, I go back to my comment earlier, what matters is what is our ideology? What is our spine? What are our moral compass? What is our idea of Israel? What is our idea of America? What is our idea of Judaism? Yeah, continue the list. That's what should guide us and drive us to take positions. Um, and, and on this, answering you, um, I, I want to say, um, will the end of the occupation bring peace? Yeah, if I kind of like summarize the, the two last questions. To be honest, and I'll be honest, this is my opinion. I don't know. I don't know. But what I know is few things. First of all is that rockets from Gaza didn't start in 2005. Thousands of rockets and mortars were fired on settlements in Gush Katif and in Israel before 2005. What I know is that the first attack from tunnels in Gaza was 2001. And I can continue the list, yeah? So trying to just throw the regular talking points that, you know, we left Gaza. Another thing I know is that a Palestinian child being born in Gaza now, he or she will get their ID number from computers of the Israeli army. Is that called, we left Gaza? Another thing, yeah, the population registration is still under Kogat, under the Israeli army, Ministry of Defense. Another thing I know is that the only way I would allow you to argue that what we are doing there is about security is if tomorrow, by 12, you know what? I'm willing to give you two more hours. Two afternoon, all the settlers are on buses coming back to Israel. And we leave the army there. And we can debate, you know, when we should end even that control or not until we have a partner or not, you know, all the slogans. But as long as we continue to build settlements and expand them, yeah, what we are telling Palestinians, us in the world, is that this is not security, that this is a colonial project. And by doing so, we are playing into the hands of the ones who are trying to color entire Israel as a colonial project. And I'm not one of those. I believe Jews have a right to self-determination. I'm a Zionist. Yeah? But by continuing to expand settlements and send more civilians there, we prove yeah, that that is the project there. And we are shooting ourselves not in the leg, but in the head. And we are painting entire Israel, and we are delegitimizing the moral existence of entire Israel. <clears throat> Look, my older brother served in another occupation in South Lebanon. There was 18 years occupation there, we tend to forget. I was born in 1982. Yeah? And there was a debate whether it was necessary to defend the north in Israel or not. But we didn't have settlements. By the way, even though the settler movement tried to build settlements there. Have you heard about that in 1983? They built one settlement and they got evacuated. What does that tell us? That when the government doesn't want something, it doesn't happen. So don't tell me stories of you know, Israeli governments being hijacked by extremists, yeah? This is the government, not extremists. Sorry. 
Um, we didn't have settlements in Lebanon. We had the army. And again, there was a fierce debate whether this is the necessary thing to defend Israel or not. We decided to end that occupation in 2000, and there was a debate until today whether it was the right thing or not. But we didn't have settlements. Okay? That is a more serious security discussion. End the settlements. Bring the settlers back to Israel. Let's have that debate. I will still argue that it's better to end occupation. But, but let's at least make that move. And then at least be honest around the table. That we are, we are actually coming to the table with genuine. I'm not saying that you are as an individual. I'm just saying I'm talking about the bigger picture. Yeah? Yeah, don't, please don't take it. This is not personal. I don't know like, your story, your history, your position. This is not by no way or mean something towards both of you in, in, in any shape or form. Please don't say. I'm talking about generally about this as an idea. Yeah? <clears throat> Let's end the settlements and have an honest conversation about these things. Again, I will have my opinions, but, um, and, and if you take, actually, by the way, the number of Israelis, soldiers and civilians who were killed from 82 to 2000 from the Lebanon occupation versus how many were killed from 2000 to today, I think that the numbers speak, uh, speak for themselves. Yeah? But, but that's a different story. The last thing I would say, again, if we talk about principles and not interest, if I will kind of like listen to my own uh, recommendation. After serving occupation for two years, after being an occupier, you know, physically, um, after 15 plus years in breaking the science of meeting, living with, yeah, dealing with hundreds, thousands of testimonies from, from soldiers, for me, permanent occupation is not an option on the table, no matter what. Yeah? This is not an option. Um, and, you know, we people take risks in life. Mm -hmm. You go out to the street, you drive, there's a yeah. chance. Who guarantees you're not going to have a car accident? And it's not that I'm trying to sympathize with this. What I'm trying to say is a principle thing. I think a true democratic nation, people, my country, the state of Israel, the way I want it to be, in the way I'm willing to kill and die for, yeah, I have no doubt I'm not a pacifist, is a country that is not an occupying power. That's what I want my country to be. Um, and the last thing I would say in terms of, as a Zionist, by the way, this very passive position of we are forced, we don't have a choice, Sounds to me like the most anti-Zionist position ever. Yeah, the way I understand Zionism is Jews coming up and saying we are fed with being ruled by others. We want self-determination. And whatever it's going to take, we're going to pursue this. Yeah? Um, and, and what we perceive, the War of Independence in 1948, what, 1% of Jewish Israeli society died? We didn't blink an eye. Think of what will happen to the American society if God forbid 1%. We didn't blink an eye. We were willing to sacrifice this for our independence. Um, I think Israel will never be what it was meant to be and what it's supposed to be and what it should be without ending occupation. Yehuda, in two sentences, because yeah. then we, I gotta let everybody go here. It would be easy for someone listening to your talk, um, to leave here saying, well, it's hopeless. It's a done deal. The annexationists are on the rise. They're going to win, or at least the control. What do you want to say to people who might leave this room saying, it's hopeless. I give up. I'm going to pursue other, other issues that I care about. No, uh, truth is, I don't think we have a choice. Yeah, for me, it's my home. It's my country my society. I'm going to fight uh, till I prevail, till we prevail. Um, and, and I, that's for me the, the very basic thing. And uh, the, the second thing is that I, I don't believe it's hopeless. 
I believe um, we just didn't try enough, and it takes time. Um, you know what the equivalent for me is? As if you would sit in 1950 and say, oh, it's hopeless to try to get the right of vote for African Americans. It's just, you know, we've been trying for so long. And, and you know, the right for women to vote, this is unthinkable. You know, it takes, go back in history and back in history. When things are wrong and we have to right those wrongs, it doesn't matter, yeah? We just wake up in the morning and have to do what we have to do, you know? There is the, there is one phrase in Pirkei Avot which I think captures for me the essence of, of, of a moral act. Um, if I'll freely translate this, it, it says, you know, it is not for you to finish a job, but it doesn't mean you can take time off. Yeah, like, if I, if I think of it. I think that captures the essence of, of what's a moral act, and, and I think that needs to be the driving force and reason to why we wake up in the morning and do what we do. After that, of course, we need to strategize and think, impact, etc. yeah, interests, yeah? Little politics need to be internalized, and, yeah, everything, but, but the driving force needs to be, yeah, is, is, is basically ending what we see as wrong. Yehuda, I want to thank you so much for joining thank us you. this morning. I want to thank all of you for being here. And there we go. That's our, that's our show for, for today. Thanks, guys. Thank you.